Hello, Garrity. You tell your team I'm ready to talk about the murders now. It may take a while, but I'm trapped. I walked into Walter Thornton's second floor office in August of 2010. I had done a lot of selling and was what you might call a top gun, but I never sold plumbing supplies. After the crash, I needed a change. Thornton was a big guy, kind of clumsy. He had a buck two smile and worked long hours and made more money than he knew about. He made you feel like you were important. Same type of deal you do every day in sales, except Walter Thornton's attitude was genuine. He poured me a tall glass of water, popped in the ice cubes, and wanted to know whom I had sold to and what kind of track record I had. If I hadn't listened to my friend Tom Cowles, I wouldn't be in the trouble I'm in now. All the characters in every book I've ever written, the murderers, the aliens that are cutthroat killers who decimate planets, of all the characters that I have written about in these books, there's none that I despise more than Gordon Butts. You just heard the beginning of Gordon Butts' extended audio as he sits in a vacant apartment and is about to confess to a series of crimes. And he'll detail the entire scenario, the saga of his life of arrogance, self-assurance, and his ultimate demise. Garrity has been tracking Gordon Butts for years. She and her team were unsuccessful in finding out if Gordon Butts killed Walter Thornton in southern New Jersey back in 2011. Suddenly, one afternoon, Garrity gets an MP4 file in her email, a file from Gordon Butts. She immediately calls everybody into the office, all her team, even the team that is disbanded, to find out what Gordon Butts would actually say to them on an MP4 file, a quite extensive file. Butts looks like hell, run down and defeated. He holds a microphone in his shaky hands and speaks into the computer's webcam. He is about to record a long scenario. He begins back in 2010 when he met with Walter Thornton. Walter Thornton owned a series of plumbing supply houses in New Jersey and one on Long Island. He exaggerates his achievements to Walter Thornton. He's impressed with his own self-importance. As he keeps saying to Garrity, he took Walter Thornton all the way in just a couple of hours of interviews. But one thing he notices during this interview is Walter Thornton retreats to the men's room. Walter Thornton leaves the door open and is popping nitro pills. Walter Thornton has heart problems. Butts like a wild animal sensing blood lusts after Walter Thornton's business and Walter Thornton's wife. He's already been out to Tanglewood, the vast estate on Long Island, where Walter Thornton's wife, a beautiful compact young thing in a green string bikini, was sunbathing just a few days before, but scoped out the whole thing. He's able to convince Walter Thornton that he's the best thing that ever sold anything even though he just lost his last job for blowing up at his boss. Once he has the job, he begins his usual trek up and down the New Jersey coast and into New York. We find him in a rundown, a rundown bar room and later in bed with a curly bleached haired hooker named Wanda Jenkins. She suggests that he puts the move on Connie Thornton. He imagines wielding great power as the company expands. He talks directly into the camera with Garrity. In March 2011, he sees an opportunity as he pulls in on a snowy afternoon to one of the warehouses in New Jersey. Just his friend Peter is in the warehouse, but upstairs, going over the books, in a tight little dress, is Connie Thornton. He had seen Connie at a previous party. She had that look about her as she met the company in her sleek red dress. Upstairs, she's going over spreadsheets on the desk in the warehouse. When she meets Gordon Butts, she says, nasty afternoon, and she accentuates the word nasty. Butts could see what was coming. She had a thick scent of perfume on. He 
Did you even ask him if you planned for dinner, Mr. Butts? Butts finds right away that she has a weakness for the crude innuendo. He suggests the Milton House, but he doesn't know whether she wanted to accompany him there or just go herself. It's obvious that she likes being in control. And all she did was talk about herself. Butts played right along. Nothing happened that night. He found her attractive and fun to be around. He actually made her laugh. Back at Crane's Beach, where he had his apartment in a rundown building called the Bryant, he met with his friend Tom Cowles. He tells Tom that Connie is his ticket to the top, how he'll run Walter Thornton's company. He keeps Tom out late to the chagrin of his girlfriend. Garrity takes a break and meets everyone at the coffee pot. They can't figure out what Butts is up to, but she starts the MP4 again on the computer. Butts talks about how he went into Guido's, a local hangout on Crane's Beach. Butts is a resentful man. He's very upset about how no one ever gave him a job and is envious of everyone that walks the face of the earth. He thinks back to the dinner he had with Connie Thornton at the Milton House and how they got along. Next day, as he cleans out his apartment and is throwing things into the trash bin, he pulls out his account sheet. And just by chance, he looks on the account sheet and sees that Connie Thornton has added $250,000 in sales, an instant gift. He goes back to Guido's and again tells Tom that he's going to take over the company. At a Tanglewood party gala, Walter calls Gordon Butts his golden boy. Connie is now very flirty and suggests to Butts that she wants lunch downtown. She starts handing him business secrets and then she starts talking about her life, how she has to cram things into her life. But Butts is very savvy and plays the game. She ate it all up as he fed into her ego. Then. After a few drinks, as she staggers to the parking lot, she hands the keys to her gray BMW. She walked him through every detail of the car, and Butt started dreaming about not having to make the next rent payment. They head out to Tanglewood, and they end up making love outside, right by the pool and the juniper trees. As the relationship accelerates, Connie arranges field calls with Walter Thornton. Butts now plans Walter Thornton's murder. He likes to intimidate men in the company. Thornton sees this as an asset. Later in the day, he goes to the public library to find out more about Walter Thornton's illness and the nitroglycerin. Maybe he could place a placebo in the prescription bottle or put something into Walter Thornton's pillbox. Or he could just dump his tablets down the storm drain. He takes his old Torino out for a practice run. He's waiting for a leased BMW in the next few weeks from Connie Thornton. He looks by the rest area where he could dump out the pills into the storm drain. He sets up a meeting with an honorary customer who never bought anything, a customer named Donovan. He tells him that Walter Thornton wants to see him. And then he tells Walter Thornton that Donovan wants to see him. He has to time this entire episode perfectly. He holds out the bait to Donovan by lowballing the price and telling him that his other supplier had been screwing him for years. He brings Walter into this scenario on April 3rd. They're going to take a back road across New Jersey to the freeway. Butts has become extremely familiar with the road and knows it exactly. We'll be 21 miles from Donovan's warehouse and far away from the interstate. There'll be wood-lined hills with fences. He'll throw the nitro case behind the fence. Butts will cleverly arrange for the car to break down by pulling the alternator wire out somewhere along the road near a series of rolling hills. Later that day, we had dinner with Connie. She acted like she knew, and Butts started growing nervous and somewhat guilty. But that didn't stop him. He heads out to a call and then to Donovan. He dumps Walter Thornton's cell phone into a trash bin as Walter is inside the restroom. Then he lets the nitro pills trickle one by one down the storm drain and he closes the case. Walter Thornton returns to the car and can't find his cell phone. 
Butts drives away down the country road and fakes the breakdown, opening the hood and disconnecting the alternator cable to the battery. Then he takes off again, knowing that the alternator is no longer charging the battery. He breaks down right at the exact location he had planned. When he tries to start the car again, nothing happens. Walter Thornton realizes he's going to have to walk and is almost challenged to keep up his, keep up his stamina. He reaches for his nitro tablets, but nothing is there. But he decides to walk anyways up the hill. It didn't take long for Walter Thornton to be face down on the road and dead. Butts thought that Garrity would find out what was going on. She and the other police were at a plaza way back at the interstate as they towed his Torino back toward the highway. He had already reconnected the alternator cable and no one ever found out. He made it a point to get a new alternator later. There was nothing on the news about the crime which upset him. And then things began to happen. It was as if Connie knew and had maneuvered Butts into killing her husband. And now she was going to use him to increase sales. She makes him vice president of sales. As Butts said, she brought me where I wanted to go. He could take chances and was ruthless. Connie and Garrity actually met out at Tanglewood. Connie shut her down. There was no direct physical proof of Gordon Butts doing anything wrong. It appeared that Walter Thornton had pushed himself and died of a heart attack. Garrity leaves Tanglewood and Connie laughs deeply, had an almost evil deep laugh as she makes love to Gordon Butts on the counter of the kitchen. Their wedding is in the Bahamas. Connie is charming. Now Gordon Butts, who just a short time ago was a drifting salesman, has unlimited credit and has a new BMW. But Butts keeps thinking about Walter Thornton's cold body in the ground. In Barbados, Connie announces that Thornton Plumbing and Supply will open many more warehouses. She explains how her father was an investment banker. She wants the expansion. She knew she slipped after having a few drinks and shouldn't have told Butts this. Butts knew that Connie was a genius using him the way she did. She drove him to kill Walter Thornton. Garrity began asking more questions six months later, bantering and innuendos, but there was no evidence. Butts goes back to the scene years later to find the nitro box, but the road is now paved. He claws through the back leaves behind the fence but couldn't find the box. Cars going by on the road freak him out. He's paranoid about Garrity. The money is flowing into Gordon Butts' life. He could have anything at any time. Butts is becoming increasingly paranoid about Garrity and her investigation. By the time he shows up at Guido's years later, he's in a Jaguar. Tom Cowles accompanies him into the restaurant, and that's where he meets Shannon, a vivacious young waitress who brought everyone in the place to life. Shannon seems to be attracted to Gordon Butts' power as vice president of the company. Butts knows that his life needs to be recharged now, and he keeps looking at Shannon Mercury. Connie becomes totally controlling and insulting, and tells Butts exactly what to do. He returns to Guido's to meet Shannon, but she wasn't there and knew she'd come back sometime later. Connie's voice begins to bother him. It's a slow wearing down, a constant battering. She's obsessed with the expansion of the company. She knows everything about the business, barking out orders and Gordon Butts jumps when she speaks. But Butts somehow loves the threat of destruction, loves being on the edge, beating the onslaught. He wonders if Connie had somebody else. He found Shannon, gets her into the booth. He ends up on a date with Shannon and spends all night with her. At one of the warehouses, he gets a call from Shannon. He thinks somebody's watching him. They plan a weekend upstate adventure. Then he finds out that Tom, his buddy, is now auditing for Connie in the warehouses. There's a lot of friction with Connie about Tom being hired. But Connie now uses a new tactic, repeating his name, Gordon, Gordon, Gordon. He wants Connie dead. He's convinced that somebody is following him and he's right. Going up with Shannon later in the week, 
he sees some little bastard tailing him. Connie's playing a cat and mouse game. He has a big blowout with Connie and leaves with Shannon. Instead of going by car, he goes by bus and then train instead because of the fear of being tailed. Shannon reports that she's feeling tired. She's reported this a couple of other times. He convinces her to see her doctor, Valdez. On the train, she admits that her boyfriend, a druggie, is gone. He makes love to her in a rustic hotel room upstate. She wants to know if he's divorcing Connie. Again, she's very tired. He wishes that Connie was gone, dead. Shannon gives him a tacit consent, but Butts wants no trail with Shannon. Butts wants to be in charge at Tanglewood and have Shannon there with him. He laughs at outwitting Connie and her lackeys as he made it upstate by bus and by train. They make the comment that they both deserve a good life together. Butts has it planned out now. He's going to push her overboard. And he's going to have an alibi at being below on the yacht. Even more perfect would be this death than Walter Thornton's death. He goes out on several cruises around Long Island with Connie and their friends. Connie is always drinking and that will be the modus operandi of this murder. Shannon is ill for a week. Butts makes the premier mistake of unloading the details of the plot to Shannon while he was drunk. And she says, Gordon, that's perfect. But Shannon is very sick. She puts off going to Valdez, but finally does. Butts finds out that Shannon has a viral infection that's very severe. He calls Shannon's machine again and again and doesn't get her. He begins his plan as Connie gets drunk on the boat. She slurs her words in front of his friends. Once up on the deck, later on he sneaks up. He pushes her overboard and then goes back to his room and then to bed. Connie is missing. The scene then opens the next morning with the marina with a detective Keel looking into this calamity on the boat. Butts then becomes afraid that Connie may not be dead. And to top it off, Garrity calls again. Now he's feeling guilty. At the same time, Valdez gives the bad results about the tests. Shannon is HIV positive. Shannon is also missing. Butts cannot reach her at her place. Valdez is convinced that Butts is infected with the HIV virus. As Butts details the end of the file for Garrity, we find out that Connie has drained Walter Thornton's accounts. All the money is gone. Cowles had been in a lifeboat. Connie was not drunk and Cowles brought her away. Shannon and Cowles were both paid off. Connie had left the country with all the money. Garrity at the end of the book arrest Butts for the murder of Walter Thornton on the Mavis Road, April 3rd, 2011. Let's talk about the characters involved in Framed. There aren't a lot of characters. There are secondary characters that support these characters. Characters like Garrity, who is doggedly on the investigation of Walter Thornton's murder. Detective Keogh, who's trying to establish a motive, or even a body, for the missing Connie Thornton. Dr. Valdez is the bearer of bad news about Shannon. However, Dr. Valdez has been paid off. Cowles has been paid off. All of these secondary characters are part of the betrayal of Gordon Butts, who's caught up in his own ego. A man who thinks he's in charge, who is in fact a mark, a target, to be used to expand the company and then discarded like rubbish into a trash bin. The most important character in Framed is Connie Thornton. Connie Thornton, who looks like she's just along for the ride with Walter, is actually the master manipulator, the grand chess player. Connie deftly manipulates Gordon Butts as she takes over Walter Thornton's company and then drains his money and leaves for parts unknown.